Today, we're going to get back right back into Esther. I feel like we've been out of it for a few weeks, but you're going to catch on very, very quickly to, uh, to, to Esther. And, and so I'll remind you of what it, it, it uh, is all about here in just a minute. But, it, you know, it, from a very, very, very <coughs> bird's eye view of, say, maybe 40,000 feet, uh, you know, Esther would be described as, a, as, a, as an action movie and a, a drama story all at the same time. I, I mean, it's just, you, you read it, and it's like watching Law and Order or going to maybe see the, the film version of Les Miserables or, you know, some exciting show that's also thick with a tremendous amount of drama. And, and, and if you can latch on to that at all, that's the story of Esther. And, uh, and, and, and though there are many parts of Esther that I love, I mean, it's, it's a pretty long book, over 10 chapters, which is about 10 chapters, the two chapters that we're on right now, chapters five and six that we're going to today, I, I think comprise uh, the, the heart of what Esther is all about, kind of the, the, the pinnacle of the story. It doesn't mean that everything from this point will be downhill, but it does mean that, that this week and next week, because this will be a two-parter, are, are pretty incredible stuff. So let me remind you of where we are in the story, because some of you might be joining us uh, afresh here today at Marketplace Bible Study. So let me just give a quick three-minute recap of where we are in the story of Esther, and then we're going to dive right in to uh, our point today. Now, it, Esther takes place, it was written by about 500 B.C. Uh, in Israel, and Israel as a nation has been completely overrun by foreign nations, and the lion's share of the people of Israel have been deported to a territory uh, north and it would be east of the Holy Land, and it's an area by the name of Persia. And, and, and the king of this vast empire, Persia, is a guy by the name of, uh, what's his name, Ahasuerus. Uh, and, 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 and Ahasuerus would be a megalomaniac that would make maybe somebody like Attila the Hun look like Mr. Rogers. So, so that would be Ahasuerus. Some of your translations might call him Xerxes, but we're going to call him Ahasuerus. It's, it's just a difference between translations. And early in the story, um, Ahasuerus gets mad at his wife Vashti, and he divorces her, and he bans her from his presence, and he marries the most unsuspecting person in the whole story, Esther, which is who the book's named after. And Esther is a beautiful, humble Jewish gal. And you might remember that Esther also, let me just go whip through all these things here. That's right. Uh, Esther also has a, a cousin, a younger cousin, uh, or no, Esther is the younger cousin, of a Jewish exile by the name of Mordecai, the only father figure Esther has really had, who checks on her just about every day at the city gate to make sure that she is doing okay now as the new queen of all of Persia married to this Castro-like leader. And one day, Mordecai, in a bold move, refuses to bow in worship to the uh, king's second in command, a guy by the name of Haman. And again, you know, it's, it's Persian culture back then. In that culture, if you didn't bow down to royalty, which Haman would have been, even though he was in the military, um, it's considered, you know, a capital offense. And Haman gets all mad. And instead of just taking out his anger on Mordecai, he decides to take his anger out on all the Jews, which has been something that's gone down through history, and he decides that a few months from that time, he would exterminate all the Jews from Persia. Now, now here's what you know. That's like, we estimate probably over a million Jews at that time. So, so this would be a holocaust on par with what happened in the 20th century. Maybe not as many people, but certainly as atrocious. And so obviously uh, Mordecai and Esther and all the Jews in Persia are, are distraught over all of this. And, and so Mordecai obviously urges Esther to go in and talk to her husband, the king, and basically say to the king, stop this. Just don't let Haman do this. You're the leader of this whole nation and, and you can stop this. The only problem is, is that Haman's plan has already been ratified by the king's own signature. 
And, 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 and so to get an audience with the king back in Persian culture back then could literally cost Esther her life. And, and, and again, it was a different culture than ours, but, but basically the rule was back then is that if anybody approached the king to ask a favor, and that meant anybody, whether you were the wife of the king or not, if anybody approached the king uh, in his official court to ask a favor or something of him and you were not summoned, then death would be the result. You, you just couldn't approach somebody as high as the king. The only way that death would not result is if the king decided to forgive you. And back in that culture, it was done by extending the golden scepter. You're going to want to hang on to that, extending the golden scepter. If the king extended the golden scepter to you, then it would be a sign that you would not be ki killed for coming into the king's court uninvited. And, and so that's really an important aspect of this story as we're going to see as we go along. And, and so this is where we are at, at Esther as we enter into chapters 5 and 6. Esther is about ready to move ahead with her plan to save the Jews by asking her megalomaniac husband, uh, Ahasuerus, if he will intervene. But she knows that by so doing, it could cost her her life. And you can read about it earlier, but that's what chapter 4 is all about. So uh, let me show you some interesting thing about as Esther's plan unfolds here that I think have everything to do with yours and my life today. So, so first, let's look at what we might call the setup to Esther's plan, the setup. Look at verses uh, 1 through 3 of Esther chapter 5. And I'm going to read it for you. It, it says, now it came about... On the third day that Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace in front of the king's rooms, and the king was sitting on his royal throne in the throne room opposite the entrance to the palace. And it happened that when ki the king saw Esther, the queen, standing in the court, she obtained favor in his sight, and here's the key thing, men, and the king extended to Esther the golden scepter, which was in his hand. So Esther came near and touched the top of the scepter. The king said to her, what is troubling you, Queen Esther, and what is your request? Even to half of the kingdom, it will be given to you. So this is really good news, if you were tracking with me earlier on, on the plot line in the book of Esther. And if you were Esther, if you had just gotten past the major hurdle of getting an audience with the king, that of approaching him without getting killed, and the king is so happy with you, because you got to remember, this guy gets very unhappy very quickly, not just because he's a man, but because he's an angry man. And so he divorced his wife just because she didn't please him at a party, his previous wife. So, so this is a really, really... Uh, uh, twitchy guy, and, and now he's so happy that he's about to offer Esther up to half of the kingdom, which would be, by the way, we know the size of the kingdom back then, it would be about the size of the whole half, southern half of the United States. If you were Esther and you were in that scenario, you got to ask yourself, what would I do at this point? Right? What would I do? I, I, I mean, the king's happy with me. He's, he's wanting to give me up to half of his kingdom. And, and, and I think most of us would say, well, this is definitely the open door that I've been asking God for. And so now is the time to ask the king to intervene. I, I, I think that's what we would say. In fact, we do this all the time in our lives, right? We feel out the mood of people around us. You ever felt out the mood of your wife? I have. And, and, and if Kim's in a good mood... Now's the time. <laughs> and if my kids are in a pretty good state of mind, now's the time to approach them on this. If, if, if my, uh, the elders at my church seem to be in a jovial spirit, now's the time to spring that new strategy on them. We, we all do this all the time in our lives, and, and, and we go for it. But what's fascinating about Esther is that she doesn't do this. Not at all. In fact, look at what she does next in verse 4 here. And uh, look at chapter 5, yeah, verse 4, chapter 5. It says, And Esther said, If it pleases the king, may the king and Haman come this day to the banquet that I have prepared for him. Now, man, that's really interesting. What does Esther do at this point? She's been accepted into the royal throne room. She can spring a request on him. He's happy. He extended the golden scepter, and she invites them to dinner, the king and Haman. 
no mention of a request, no dropping the bomb, no capitalizing on Ahasuerus's good mood and desire to give her, by the way, half of Texas, New Mexico, Louisiana, Oklahoma, Arizona, Florida, and California, which is basically what he offered her, she invites him and Haman to dinner. I, I call this aspect of Esther's plan, phase one, the banquet or the immediate banquet. And, and you and I might be thinking, okay, kind of strange, but let's read what happens next. So let's look at verses five through six here. It says, then the king said, bring Haman quickly that we may do as Esther desires. So the king and Haman came to the banquet, which Esther had prepared. And as they drank their wine at the banquet, the king said to Esther, what is your petition? <laughs> Isn't that interesting? That's on his mind. For it shall be granted to you. And what is your request? Even to half of the kingdom. He says it again, it'll be done. And so again, we're tracking with this drama. We go, okay, now, Esther, now is the time to go for the jugular. Now is the time to ask the king. He's primed. He's ready. I mean, when are men most amenable to doing what women want? When they've eaten. So he's just eaten, and, and he's filled with a little bit of wine. He's in a good mood. He's still mentioning the southern half of the kingdom. And, and so I'm just telling you, you guys got to enter into the story here. Most of us would be dropping the bomb about now. I mean, we, again, we've had lots of experience with this. I, I mean, we know how to, how to work with other people, don't we? I mean, most of you guys are business guys or in some educational sector or something like that. You've read Zig Ziglar books. You've gone to Tony Robbins seminars. You've, you, you, you've done the Dale Carnegie stuff. The only problem is, is that Esther hasn't read of any Zig Ziglar's books and she hasn't gone to any seminars. And, and so she's not going to do this next. In fact, look at what she does next. Look at verses 7 through 8. It says, So Esther answered and said, My petition and my request is this, if I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and do right a request, may the king and Haman come to the banquet which I have prepared for them, and tomorrow I will do as the king says. And so she eventually, or essentially, invites them to another dinner tomorrow with more food, more wine, another night for a Ahasuerus to sleep on it and to think, what is my wife up to? So I call this phase two, the banquet again, or the banquet tomorrow. And it is worth noting here that only after the setup only after banquet number one, into banquet number two, that Esther tells the king in Haman's presence about the plan to exterminate all the Jews and pleads for him to intervene. So it says in chapter 6, verse 14, we'll skip ahead just for a second right now, it says that while they were still talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hastily brought Haman to the banquet which Esther had prepared. And it is here that we're going to kind of parse out more next week that Esther then reveals all that is happening and asks her husband, the king, to intervene and to set justice in the course there of injustice. Now, man, before we get to that next week, I want to spend the rest of our time this morning, now that you get chapter 5 and into chapter 6, um, wrestling with something that theologians, I kid you not, have been wrestling with for 2,500 years with the book of Esther. And, uh, and, and, and the question is, why did Esther develop and execute what I would call this staggered, stalling, and downright maze-like plan for Ahasuerus to see the folly of killing all the Jews? That, that's what we need to wrestle with. Why did she go to all of this trouble to communicate her wishes, especially when from the very get-go, from the very, very first meeting with the king, see, things seem to be absolutely fine. You need to know, uh, expert Bible commentators have wrestled with this literally for thousands of years now. Uh, I mean, every one of them who's ever written on Esther has wrestled with this issue before us here today. So let me share with you some of their suggestions. Some have said, well, maybe it was due to fear that Esther was just afraid, she was timid, she was young, and so she took baby steps to execute her plan. 
And though we might admit that Esther had some fear, the problem with this solution is that there's no indication in the text here that fear was driving her. I mean, usually in the Bible, when fear is going to play into the situation, the author will tell you. So, for instance, when Peter was afraid of the winds and the waves in the Gospels, what does it say? He was afraid. It doesn't make us assume that. If the author wants us to know that this is what's in play, it usually tells us there's nothing here mentioned about that. So others have surmised that maybe uh, Esther was using some simple form of psychological manipulation, you know, kind of like a delay tactic to get Ahasuerus filled with some wine and give him a couple of good meals and wet his whistle with curiosity, you know, sort of stringing him along psychologically that would get him even more softer to Esther's eventual request. And the only problem is that one, in my mind, is that the author makes it very clear early on in chapter 5 that the king was already soft enough, right? I, I mean, how soft do you have to be to, to immediately extend the golden scepter and then say up to half the kingdom, which by the way, this guy was, I mean, he was cheap. He didn't give anything away. And so up to half the kingdom is yours. I mean, would you ever say to your wife, she said, honey, you know, pillow talk, honey, I got, I got a request for you tonight. What is it, honey? Up to half my business. It's all yours. I mean, he just, we just don't do things like that. And, and so the king, the author makes it very clear, the king was very soft. So others have said, well, maybe this was Oriental custom in Persia, you know, or Mideastern custom, you know, kind of like how they did things back then. But again, we, we don't have any evidence of that. that. There's no evidence that Esther's plan had anything to do with Persian custom. That's just a guess, and I don't think a very good one. So, so a fourth suggestion that some have said, and this one, again, this is where our culture, this actually occurred about the 19th, 20th century with some of the more liberal scholars. They said, well, maybe the author just included all these details, a, a redactor just included all these details later to, to sort of spice up the story and, and make it better. That really it happened much more simply than the story we have before us, but somebody came along and they call it author inclusion or authorial inclusion. And they just added it. But again, th th this is the Bible. We, we, we have great evidence, and this is for another talk, but we have great evidence that the Bible you and I have today was the Bible that was originally written, and, and we have no evidence that it was messed with. So that, that doesn't even hold any water. No, I think something else together, altogether, was going on in Esther's mind here. Something that I and many others believe has have everything to do with the title of this whole study we're doing this fall is, and, and that is God Behind the Scenes. So, so, so look up here on the screen. Here's what I believe Esther was doing uh, in this text here, and that is that she was uh, slowing way down, m moving at an even and concerted clip, while all the time she was looking for and leaving room for God's intervention into the scene. I, I, I'm going to convince you here today, if you're at all doubting this, that this is what's happening in this story. In other words, what I think Esther is doing here, men, is leaving lots of room for God to act and to breathe into her plans, lots of room for God to show up and do something, whatever he would choose to do, to bring deliverance to his people. In short, she was leaving lots of room for God who was behind the scenes in the story. Again, remember, the story doesn't mention God at all. That's key to understanding Esther. Doesn't mention God, doesn't mention prayer, doesn't mention the law, doesn't mention the temple, it doesn't mention anything that would be normal in an Old Testament book. Esther was leaving lots of room for God, who's behind the scenes in this book, to come to the forefront and to orchestrate events that Esther could not control, to orchestrate events in his sovereignty and his providence that only he could orchestrate. And I believe that's why Esther moved forward during the setup when she approached the king and then stopped and gave some space. And then she moved forward again during phase one, the banquet, and then she stopped and gave some more space. And then she moved forward again during phase two, the banquet again or tomorrow, and then stopped and gave some space. Notice each time pausing, waiting, giving God lots of room to orchestrate things 
that only he could do. I, I, I hope you can see that. I'll show you why I think this is the case in a minute. But first, just see that what I'm suggesting is that Esther <coughs> left intentionally a lot of God room, lots of room for him to show up and do what only he could do, and that I think that was core to her plan. Now, now, now why do I think this? When you look closely at what happens between Esther's invitation to banquet number two and then the banquet that actually takes place, there's some amazing things that occur that even the most skeptical person would have to chalk up to divine intervention. What am I talking about? In, in, in verse, let me do I have it up here? I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I listed it for you. In, in verses 9 through 14 of chapter 5, again, this is between banquet number 1 and banquet number 2, S, or Haman, the one who was plotting all of this catastrophe, for, catastrophe upon the Jews, happens to bump into Mordecai again, and Mordecai, true to form, does not bow to Haman again. And so Haman says, enough of waiting to exterminate all the Jews. I'm going to hang Mordecai immediately. He's just so offended that Mordecai won't bow. And so he actually goes home and he builds a hangman's noose that was about 75 feet tall for all of Susa, the capital of Persia, to see. And he plans on hanging Mordecai the next day. But then, during the night, the king couldn't sleep. Again, we're between banquet number one and banquet number two. The king couldn't sleep, and the text implies that this was an unusual occurrence. It says in, in verse 1 of chapter 6, the sleep of the king fled. And so the king calls one of his servants to read him a bedtime story from the history books, and the story happens to be about a time very early on in Esther where Mordecai had actually foiled a plot to assassinate the king. Some of you might remember that, where Mordecai actually had heard about a plot to assassinate the king. So they read Ahasuerus that story as kind of a bedtime story. And the king realizes that he had never rewarded Mordecai for this. So the next morning, he looks for someone to give him wisdom on what would be the best way to honor Mordecai for saving his life. And who happens to be in the court at exactly that moment where the king needs wisdom on how to honor Mordecai? <coughs> Haman. But the king doesn't tell Haman that it's Mordecai. He just says, there's this guy who I want to honor. There's this guy who's been really faithful to me and really good to me, and I want to bestow upon him an amazing, great honor. And who does Haman think the king is talking about? himself. Isn't this interesting? And, and thinking that the king uh, wanted to, to honor himself, <clears throat> in Haman's mind, he says, well, you got to dress this guy up and treat him like a king and put a royal robe on him and a royal horse and lead him through town, you know, and that would be a, a real honor for everybody to see how much favor you have on him. <laughs> and so the king says, do it. And Haman then realizes that it's Mordecai now, don't miss this, guys. The same guy that he's supposed to hang that morning in front of all of Susa, he, he now is the one who has to dress up Mordecai and take him all the way through town. I mean, talk about a total turn of events. Talk about irony. So, so, so don't miss all this. You have Haman bumping into Mordecai, the gallows being built for Haman, or for Haman to hang Mordecai, the king not being able to sleep, the precise historical account read, Haman being there early in the court that morning, the king bumping into Haman and asking for his wisdom, the honor planned for Mordecai, and then Haman having to lead Mordecai throughout the city, humiliated as he has to honor this guy that he's plotting all this revenge against. And all of this, let me bring us back to this, is a prelude to Esther, about ready to go into banquet number two, to reveal her plan of Haman's to annihilate all the Jews. <coughs> Somebody once said this. They once said that the definition of a coincidence is that God performs a miracle and prefers to remain anonymous. And I would submit to you that that's what's going on here. We're tempted to argue that this is a coincidence. I don't think so. I, I, I think that Esther, being spiritually attuned, was somebody who said, I'm going to move a little bit forward, 
then wait on God. Move a little bit forward, then wait on God. Move a little bit forward and wait on God. And sure enough, what we see contained in the story are things happening that you just can't chalk up to coincidence. It's God orchestrating events and intervening in the way that only he could. And, and you know, some people over the years have tried to say, well, maybe Esther orchestrated all this. Maybe she manipulated everything. And I just go, oh, come on. I, I mean, for Esther to have manipulated all of this, she would have had to make sure that Haman bumped into Mordecai she would have to make sure that Haman's wife is the one who actually suggested that the gallows be built. Then she'd have to make sure that she slips the king a mickey so that he can't sleep or whatever you'd give somebody to not be able to sleep. Then she'd have to see that he wanted a bedtime story. She'd have to make sure that precise story would be read. Then she'd have to make sure that Haman is in the court early that next morning. Then she would have to secretly suggest to Haman what kind of honor to bestow. And then she'd have to make sure that Ahasuerus would be the one to have Haman carry it out personally. And eventually you have to say, there's just too many coincidences here. There's no way that Esther could have done all that. She couldn't control any of this. It was God. It was Esther's well-laid plan. But please see, her only plan was to take baby steps forward and let God do the rest. I like how one commentator sums this up. I don't think I have it on a quote here. Let me see. Um, no, I don't. Um, we'll leave that up there right now. As one commentator says it this way, he says, Esther sensed that the time was not right for her important request. Time was needed for some other details to fall in place in God's providence before Esther made a request. I, I, I think that's it right there. She, she was leaving God room. And so here's our main point, obviously, for our lives today that we're going to spend the remaining few minutes we have here today on. And, and I think it's such an important point in our fast-paced, highly pragmatic, always driven society. And that is that in your plans and decisions and my plans and decisions, we need to leave lots of God room that honor his activity and his timing. I would say it this strongly, if you don't hear or take anything away from the entire book of Esther, this is what you want to take away. This is worth the price of admission right here. <laughs> that, 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 that in our relationship with God today, no matter where you might happen to be in your walk with him, you and I need to learn the fine art of how to leave God room in all of our thinking, our feeling, our acting, because we rob ourselves of the opportunity as Blackaby would say, to experience God when we fail to do this. Because you see, God room slows down enough and leaves enough gap in our lives for his movement and his timing. Uh, Franklin Graham, you know, some of you might know that name. Franklin Graham is the son of the famous evangelist Billy Graham. And Franklin Graham wrote a book a few years back, probably over a decade ago now that I read, called Rebel with a Cause. And it was a great title. The title alone made me want to buy the book. And it's basically his autobiography of how, as a young guy, Franklin Graham rebelled against the Graham family in a fairly significant way and went off to do his own thing. And it's a story, kind of like a prodigal son, of, of coming back to, uh, to God and back to his family. And the subtitle of the book, by the way, is called Rebel of the Cause, Finally Comfortable Being a Graham. And, and, and so can you imagine being Billy Graham's son? And it's actually a fascinating read with a lot of funny stories about growing up in North Carolina and traveling the world as, as, as Billy Graham's son. But, but it's also a, uh, an amazing journey of how he rebelled, but then came so far back into the fold that he founded one of the world's most largest and profound relief organizations known as Samaritan's Purse. And in the book, Franklin tells the story of one of the guys that helped bring him back to God and bring him back to an awareness of justice. And it was unlike, an unlikely candidate by the name of Bob Pierce. Uh, Bob Pierce was the founder of World Vision. But Bob Pierce eventually got fired from World Vision because he was very much a maverick and is doing those things and a very eccentric personality. And, and, and you'll hear in a second here, as Graham says, people either loved him or hated him. <laughs> And so let me read you what he says about, about Bob Pierce, because this will be important for what Graham learned from him. He says, in October of 1975, I met Bob in Los Angeles. Bob had struggled through tragedies in his own life, a rocky marriage, 
discord within World Vision, the organization he had founded and then would lose, a nervous breakdown and the tragic suicide of a daughter. Although these events might have destroyed others, Bob refused to give up on life. He wanted more than anything to serve Christ with his heart, soul, and body. Bob was a complex person. At times he could be warm and tenderly sensitive, then brazen and abrupt. I had learned that few people felt neutral about Bob. People either loved the guy or had little use for him. I liked him because he was so unorthodox and I was just coming off my rebellion. He just didn't do things like everybody else did. He goes on to say, Bob really cared for the hurting and downtrodden, but as I would learn on a trip, Bob could easily become angry and demanding. Yet minutes later, he would realize what he had done and humbly ask for forgiveness. More than anything else, though, Bob was a passionate evangelist. When Bob gave food or provided medicine or offered other assistance to those in need, he did it in such a way that they understood that the good works were done in the name of Jesus, the same one who had died for their sins. Bob always urged people to repent of their sin and invite Jesus into their hearts. And so this is 1975 when Franklin is traveling uh, throughout Korea and Hong Kong and China and India and Iran and even to the remote jungles of Thailand with Bob. And Bob's simply trying to get him to see the need for physical relief and the gospel to be brought together. And, and at one key point in this trip, while buried deep within the jungle, Bob revealed to Franklin uh, a most central part of his walk with God. So, so dial into this, men. This is your mentor. This is a guy bringing you back to the Lord. This guy's teaching you how to walk with him. Not, not, not through just how to have a quiet time, because Graham knew how to do that, but more how to relate to God. And, and listen how Graham describes it. He says, the lesson Bob taught me. Let me see. Oh, where do I have it here? Let me see. I got that. Nope. We're going to get that second. He says, the lesson that Bob taught me that stands out above all else is what Bob called God room. As Bob puts it, God room is when you see a need and it's bigger than your human abilities to meet it, but you accept the challenge, you trust God to bring in the resources to meet the need. That's God room. Later on in that trip, to make sure that he got the principle, he would say it to it again. And I put this one up here on the screen. He says, God room is when you have seen a need, you believe God wants you to meet, and you try, but you can't. And after you've exhausted all of your human effort, there's still a gap. No matter what you do, you just can't humanly bring it about. That's when you pray and leave room for God to work, and you watch God close the gap. I, I got to tell you, when I, when I read this biography over ye, 10 years ago, I, I, I've never forgotten that room, or that word, God room, that, that, that phrase, God room where you leave room and space in your life for God to do what he wants to do. And I, and I gotta tell you, man, this is eminently biblical. The Bible says this. The Bible says that faith, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, is the substance of things hoped for and the assurance of things not seen. And, and so God room is all about trusting God in the times when he is most unseen, Right? God room is all about leaving room for God in the times where we realize that if he doesn't show up, something's not going to happen. And the simple logic is when our lives are so humanly limited and safely controlled, which most Christians live today, when we can accomplish everything that we set out to do on our own, then neither faith nor God room is needed, right? I mean, think about it. But we, we all say we might need faith, but we really don't. We're in control of everything, and everything seems to be going just fine. And so faith only becomes faith. God only becomes real when we leave room in our lives for him to show up and do what only he can do. And you have to have God room to do this. And so really, I really want you guys to apply this to your own life here today, <laughs> that in all of your plans and dreams right now, and all that you're doing in your life right now, whether it be on your job or in your marriage or with your children or with your retirement or with your church or even in your own emotions, you got to ask yourself here today, this is the key question. I think it's the whole question in the book of Esther. How much God room is there? In other words, dare to ask yourself these questions. Uh, how much of my life is accomplished by my own effort? And wouldn't that be a good question to ask? 
I, I mean, I'm going to go into my day today as a pastor. And I have Marketplace Bible Study. I got a meeting with Al, which I got some decisions to make between 9 and 10. I'm going to work out with Lance a little bit later. I meet with my whole staff at noon, and then I have to get going on my sermon for this Sunday, this afternoon. So I got a bunch of activities here today. If I get to the end of the day and do an audit of my life, wouldn't it be a powerful thing to ask, how much of this did I do today based on just my own human strength? I, I mean, I'm pretty gifted. I got a pretty good IQ. I've I've got a master's degree in theology. I've been going at this now for 25 years. In fact, I was telling Corey the other day that, you know, Malcolm Gladwell, I think it's in that book of his where he says uh, that, you know, if you commit 10,000 hours to your craft, you've perfected it. I, I realized the other day that I've actually spent 15,000 hours over the last two decades in sermon preparation and sermon delivery. So one could argue I've, I've honed that craft very well. So I could easily go through this day. Now, don't miss this, men and leave very little God room in my life. Amen. As a pastor, <laughs> as a follower of Jesus, as somebody that people look up to and want to emulate, and to use the wording of the book of Galatians, I could live in the flesh all day today and not really live at all in the spirit. I, 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 really, this is what one author calls the difference between naturally accessible reality and supernaturally accessible reality reality. What reality are you accessing? Because see, I think most Christians just live a baptized form of the natural life every day. The only reason I say baptized is because we talk a good game. We read the daily bread, we read the Jesus calling, we said a few prayers, we're going to be as moral as we can. And through going through a day like that, we think that we're doing pretty good, what Crab calls good enough Christianity. And I think Esther comes along and says, look at her life because she left a lot of room for God. Look at Franklin Graham's life. He leaves a lot of room for God. And, and so I guess the, the question I would ask is, how much God room is there in your life? And, and are you following the God room rules? You're saying, what are those rules? Just look at Esther. You, you need to slow down in your plans. You need to stagger them a little bit. You need to stop at key points in your life. And say, you know what, Lord, I have no sane reason for doing this, but I'm going to stop and pause for a couple of days before I make this decision. I'm going to stop and pause a couple of days before I make any more action on this big move in my life, if for no other reason than to give you room to step in and do what you want. Guys, I pray this all the time. Yeah, Corey's probably heard that when I pray. I pray to, that, that, Lord, if the road I'm going around right now is the wrong road, intervene run interference, do something, knock me down, do something to prevent me from doing this. But you see, here's the problem. If I pray that and then I keep going, God might tackle me. He loves me that much, but it's a lot easier for him to get my attention if I'm still. And he says, okay, thanks for staying there. I'm about ready to do something. See, it's just that we as Christians don't leave a lot of room for God to do that. And so this is the message, I think a huge message of Esther here today. Now, next week we're going to talk a little bit more about how we can build more God room into our life. This is a two-parter, this, this well-laid plan thing. But, but more today, I want to just get you into the realm of God room and what, what it is and what it means and, and to get you thinking about it. Uh, years ago when I first developed my uh, study on Esther, I was... Uh, looking for illustrations on, on God room. And I, I ran across a company uh, in California, this was when I was living in Cleveland, that had just started up a few years before that, that was very, very bold in their proclamation of who God is, but it was an agricultural company. It was a company that, that actually dispensed uh, biomedical organisms in order to protect crop predators. So they were kind of fighting crop predators with, with other types of, uh, of, of organisms. And the company was called Ag Attack, so Agricultural Attack. And, and the guy that ran it, a guy by the name of Warren Stewart, uh, was a professor at a uh, local community college. He was a well-educated man, uh, president of his company, and a naturalist himself, and, and really had done a lot to to uh, build this technology-based agricultural business. And, and as I was looking at his website back then, it was interesting because he had a whole section on his business portion of his website devoted to this idea of God room. 
And, and, and I thought that was very interesting. Let me read for you what he wrote. And he, goes, he goes, what is the point of God room as applied to Ag Attack, his company? He said simply this, if God wants our business to survive or thrive, he is going to have to do the impossible. Nothing, nothing less than God's action is needed. I've done everything that I know how. Do you wonder why I'm writing this? First, I would like you to know that my wife and I have faith in the God of the Bible. We are imperfect, especially in my case, but we have chosen to put our faith in God's Son, Jesus. We certainly don't consider ourselves better than anyone else for doing this because we believe that God drew us to himself. He's a Calvinist, I think there, doctor. Amen. We have no room to boast. Yes. While I do not want to offend anyone, perhaps you as well will think about your own relationship with God. But then he says, secondly, I write this to you so that you may give thought to the God room principle in your life. There's only so much that we can do, only so far that we can go on our own. Yet God can do so much more than we can possibly realize. Then he asks, have you gotten to the point where you are ready to let God completely take control of everything in your life. I have. He says, I am not writing this in expectation that God will bless Ag Attack because I have somehow challenged God to do something special. God's reasons for prospering a business are unknown and perhaps even unknowable to me. But listen to what he says. He says, I have gotten to the point, however, where I understand as completely as I can that nothing further will happen unless Ag Attack has a God room experience. Since God is in total control of this, I experience no pressure or concern. God can do all things. He will do for Ag Attack, Ag Attack what is best in his eyes. Our trust remains in him completely. Don't you love a guy that approaches his business like that? Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, let me share with you two, two bits of news, one that will kind of be bad news, but then uh, I'm going to show you the good news in it. The bad news is I tried to find this guy in the internet now about six, seven years later, ag attack went down. Laugh at that a little bit. That, that's a bummer. And, 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 and here's the good news. It was started in 1990. He, he, he wrote this in about 2003. It, it, it survived up until just about two or three years ago. It had a good 20 year run. And this guy is now doing some other computer software stuff because he's very entrepreneurial in nature. You see, I think this is a guy who, who asked God to put his hand on his business, and for a very, very long time, God did. Because he gave God lots of room in his life, and God is in the business for those who trust him and for those who are following him to entering into their circumstances and doing whatever he wants to do. And I don't know if you guys caught it, but I loved when he said, I I'm not writing this, I'm not expecting that God will bless Agatak because I have somehow challenged him to do something special. He wasn't asking that. He was trusting God to do whatever he wanted to do as he gave God room in his life. And, and so next week, we're going to talk about how. Next week, we're going to talk about how we can be in that place, that no man's land between banquet number one and banquet number two, where we leave room for God to do what he wants to do. And it'll be a very practical message. But for this week, I simply guys want you guys to start chewing uh, on this idea of God room for your life. Because I got to tell you, it, it has been a great friend to me over the years, just this principle. There have been so many times where I'm moving ahead, and just for no sane reason at all, I'll stop. And I'll say, let's wait on God. I, I did this with my board just a little while back, where we were moving ahead with some decisions. And it was about two years ago, and we we're going to get ready for a capital campaign. I just, I just think, we, think we need to slow down, and let's just think about this. Let's pray about this. Let's, let's leave room for God to do or say what he wants to do or say. And, and it always has served me well, always.